You can all hear me, uh, that's better. Um, this is the first time ever chairing a talk in a silent disco format, so this is definitely a new experience for me. I'm sure it is for all of you as well. Um, we've still got a few people kind of coming in, but I think I'll kind of get started because we don't have a lot of time. Um, my name's Amy Frearson. I'm a journalist and editor based here in London. Um, those of you that know me probably do as editor-at-large for Dezine. Um, I've got, we've got some great panelists here. We're going to be covering the, copic, the topic of graphic design, typography, and type design. Um, so I'm joined by, in turn, we've got Neville Brody, um, who I'm sure for most of you needs no introduction. Um, he's a creative director, business strategist, and typographer, uh, founder of Brody Associates, your own studio. Um, your clients are pretty impressive roster of Nike, BBC, Christian Dior, Supreme, Coca-Cola. Uh, you are Professor of Communication at the RCA and formerly Dean. And um, Thank you very much. good introduction. <laughs> and then next up we have uh, Chloe Templeman. I didn't try to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, Chloe is uh, Executive Creative Director of Big Fish, um, a, a company who also have pretty impressive clients as well, like uh, the likes of Freddy's Flowers, Clipper Tees, Dorset Cereals. Um, previously creative director for Design Bridge, um, ran accounts for Fortnum & Masons, Diageo, Unilever, um, and specifically a mentor on DNAD's new, new Blood Shift London program, and also executive cre creative director of DNAD's Shift Studio, so a real focus on nurturing emerging talent. Have you really done your research here? <laughs> do my best. <laughs> Next up, uh, we switched around from the order we have on here, but uh, we have uh, Nupur Date. Um, she's a type designer from Mumbai, um, one of the winners of the pencil here at the awards last year. Um, she's co-founder of EK Type, a collaborative type foundry specializing in contemporary Indian typefaces. And her winning project last year was the Anek Multiscript Variable Font Family. Um, <coughs> which is a pretty fantastic design I wasn't familiar with before and very much enjoyed reading more about. And at the end here, we have Ricardo Bezzera, and also a translator with him who's going to be helping him along. Uh, Ricardo is uh, from Brazil. Um, he is the director of design and strategy at Tatil Design, and uh, an agency with studios in Rio, Sao Paulo, and also in Paris, and has worked for clients including Coca-Cola, Danone, and Netflix. Um, and most, most excitingly, sort of has designed branding for the likes of the Rio Carnival and for the Rio 2016 Olympics and Paralympic Games. So a fantastic panel. Um, each of them have got a project um, from the awards that they're going to talk about before we kind of launch in our discussion. So Neville, I'm going to, you're up first. Um, let's have your video and then uh, you can tell us a little bit about it.
So Neville, tell us a little bit about what we've all just seen and, uh, and, and why you sort of select this project to chat about today. Um, I think graphic design is in a really interesting place right now. And it's being impacted by technology in a way that we've never imagined would happen. And, you know, I've come out of print graphics, basically. But now we're seeing that graphic design has to operate across a number of complex media spaces. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're seeing a shift away from graphic design as something that expresses content to something that delivers content. So most platforms and most brands have actually dumbed down the expression in order to lift the content. So brands move more and more towards activation and away from personality. But here we see an amazing thing with NRK. NRK is the Norwegian national broadcast company. And historically, you would be looking at something that works in motion graphics and then maybe a business card or a sign. But brands now have to operate across a number of different platforms. Um, in a very fluid way. And I think what NRK have done is they've successfully created a, a core DNA which is both scalable and fluid and adaptable to allow any form of expression or information and at the same time maintain that personality. Um, I think it's an incredible project. Fantastic. And there's a really interesting kind of shift and one, I guess, yeah, that I guess for a lot of places can really limit creativity. What, what was it about this project, like how, how, like how do you think they were able to kind of bring in that level of character into the design they created? Because I think they put movement and fluidity and evolution at the heart of the brand. So it's not about creating fixed elements. It's actually saying at the heart of our brand is motion. Life is motion. Entertainment is motion. Um, information is motion. So they've put a time element at the heart of what would have been a, a rigid logo. So potentially today's graphic designers have to be motion designers to really kind of have that impact across across other media, or at least or be, or be collaborating with. Well, it's like an architect doesn't need to know how to make bricks, but they need to know what bricks do. So when we're doing brand design now, we need to be aware of the impact and possibility of motion in the work that we're doing. And it becomes another dimension. Um, scalability, movement, sound, everything. So a brand now is a complex molecule. Really, really interesting. Um, let's have the next video, Chloe, the one you've selected. I'm really keen to see. Do we need to move? Can we stay sat?
Great. It's really handy when there's a video that kind of explains the whole idea so that everybody <laughs> just gets it. Um, similar to the one that Neville chose, we didn't actually realise they were both going to choose uh, quite similar things. I think this was in integrated design uh, as well. So it wasn't just um, what really stood out for me on this one is every single touch point had been thought about. And it all kind of came from that core idea and a real strong, this sort of the, the zero and the one. So it could have just been, um, you know, based on the binary system, it could have just been the same thing, uh, you know, over and over again. I think what we loved about these is every single touch point was thought about. Um, when we saw the, the posters with the, the kind of tumbling down, um, even things like the ring binders, any time there was a circle, there was always that little dash. And actually, the designers had really thought through um, and really kind of gave it over to the students as well. And I think the fact that they could then write their own names or they could write certain things in it and actually became something that they could be really proud of. Um, it didn't show it here, but if you looked at what it was before, it was, yeah, you'll have to Google it. It was so bad beforehand. Um, and actually, the, the students then became super proud of it um, taking over the, the sort of the uni campus, so it was a bit of wayfinding. It, it kind of encompassed everything, but it didn't feel like it was kind of boring. And I think because it stemmed from, um, so this is in South Africa, it kind of stemmed from that truth um, of the, the stop and repeat patterns that they would paint on the outside of the buildings. It felt like actually taking a tradition and kind of modernising it and, and making it really relevant for the for the next generation. It was just something that kind of caught all the judges eyes the minute we saw it and we kept uh, kind of talking about it and uh, and to your point about you know it didn't fall down on any touch point whereas some of the other integrated graphics they were great as a poster or they were great on certain things and then when it kind of came off or did something else it really fell down um, so for this this is a real 360 for us and this feels like really sort of tying back to what Neville was saying before because I think like you say sort of actually the simplicity of just the dot and the dash Without this sort of, without the sort of animation element, without the sort of thinking about the movement, that idea could have felt very flat or very kind of. It wouldn't have had, I guess, the, the sort of excitement or the sort of characteristic that it seems to have here. Yeah, and I think it's the confidence as well of not overdoing it. And actually, we saw um, quite a lot. I mean, I think in graphics then you had like 600 entries, and there was some that were like throwing all the trends, all the graphics upon graphics. Uh, why have one typeface when you can have 700? You can have infinite. And actually, um, I really like the confidence uh, that this one had. And even just using, you know, just black and white across everything, it was really, sh it felt for us, it really kind of stood out. Um, and actually, when you when we did see all the other entries, there was a, a real confidence um, that the way that, that the guys had kind of saw it through every touch point and, and not been tempted to over-design it. Great. I'm conscious we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to move along to Ricardo, who's next. And Ricardo's got an example. You were judging the typography category, that's right, isn't it? Um, let's have your video. Yes. Fact, designers hate Comic Sans. Also fact, dyslexics love it. Its irregularity is what helps them to read better. Dyslexic minds like Einstein, Spielberg, Ali and Jobs but designers couldn't care less. Comic Sans is wonky, it's ugly, it's a layout no-go. Well, it's time they got a wake-up call. There's nothing comic about dyslexia. A campaign inviting designers to create fonts that are both dyslexia-friendly and beautiful at the same time. First, we targeted the world's top designers on their Instagram each getting a personalized message using Comic Sans in their own design language. Hey Stefan, we understand that beauty can change the world, but what about doing that with the world's ugliest font? Or, hey Eike, since your creative thoughts trigger the ubiquitous media cacophony, imagine what adding Comic Sans to the mix could do, and many more. Hey Jessica, hey Alex, hey David, hey Sasha, hey Gemma, hey Warriors Studio. But we didn't stop there. Everywhere designers looked, they saw our message. On street posters, postcards, and in industry magazines. Our call didn't go unnoticed by the community. Miami Ad School introduced the world's first inclusive design class. And we transfer stamped our cry on their online walls, bringing an army of designers to our page, where they learned more about dyslexia and how to develop dyslexia-friendly typography. Just like font guru Daniel Brockstad, who gave birth to a typeface as variable as dyslexia itself. 
inspiring others to use design to develop work that helps 780 million people feel more included in society. Oh, thanks, David. Wow, what an interesting project. Um, I'm fascinated to find out more about it, not one I'm familiar with. Um, Ricardo, tell us a little bit about why you picked uh, this project. Good morning. Perdoem pelo inglês, eu vou falar em português com vocês. O Adriano está aqui para me ajudar na tradução. My apologies for not speaking English, but uh, he has Adriano to help uh, translate into everyone. É, embora eu tenha já bastante experiência com premiações, tanto avaliando projetos quanto colocando projetos para serem avaliados, essa é a minha primeira vez como jurado no Dia D&D. Então, é, entendam que o que eu vou trazer aqui é uma percepção fresca de uma pessoa que está estreando no, no evento. Although uh, I have been part of all the juries, it's the first, my first time in D&D, so uh, I feel like a freshman, or like a rookie, and, and I, I believe I'm bringing not only my, you know, my fresh eyes, but also my fresh impression of the projects and the project he judged, yeah. and also about this particular project. Yeah. Então, uma das percepções que eu tenho, que eu acredito, que os projetos capturam a gente pela dimensão emocional. Dos mais de 100 projetos que eu avaliei dentro da categoria, alguns saltam aos olhos, chamam a atenção. Esse foi um deles. Então, é, mesmo antes da gente submeter o projeto ao shortlist, esse projeto me destacou, porque ele me, claramente me provocou como designer. Isso de cara foi algo importante. Eu acho que isso é um critério valioso né, nas, nas inscrições. Destacar, se destacar da, da multidão. So, uh, for all the over 100 uh, projects that was uh, submitted, this one, since uh, not only this one, but also all the projects that he shortlist, they, they caught his attention by emotion. Uh, no, the, the, the first moment that almost like flicking, if possible, to flick everything you can with the computer. This one was the one of that really shouts out for him because of uh, the not only about the font or the everything that behind the comic sounds, but because there's something behind it that it's uh, it was magical for him. Yeah, ele me fez pensar é, para quem a gente cria, porque o design ele existe a, em função do público, né? Eu estou atendendo uma demanda do mundo, eu estou atendendo uma expectativa de alguém. Então muitas vezes a gente se pega criando para nós mesmos. Então esse projeto provoca no sentido de recuperar a dimensão original do design, que é fazer algo para o outro. E dessa perspectiva também me veio uma outra me senti provocado na dimensão de entender o que é bonito. O que é bonito? Bonito para quem? Então eu acho que esse projeto ele faz uma provocação de uma retomada da nossa intenção como de designers, que é fazer algo para o outro e não para nós mesmos e também de provocar o que é bonito, o que é estético, porque eu não estou criando para uma pessoa, estou criando para muitas. Então a perspectiva inclusiva, diversa que ele traz, foi um dos pontos que me fez destacar. So for Ricardo is that the fact that the, the, the project not only uh, brings or raises the, the core question about for whom we design is not for ourselves, but of course we have our hands or our thoughts, our uniqueness as designers behind every single project but also to think about who are we designing to, who is the client, and the, what the, what's the best, um, best approach or best solution we can, uh, and not only using the, the fonts that we believe is the best one. And mainly the, the fact that also uh, the other second core, uh, basically for, for, for Ricardo and this one, is what is ugly. So for, for one person, uh, one designer, Comic Sans or Helvetica, they are the best ones, for the other ones are not. So it, uh, it raised the question, and we are talking about, the, about this pro uh, particular project right now just because of that. So it raises the, 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 the question of what is ugly, what is not ugly. We see that in the, the art world, but also in the design world. For him, uh, he believes that it's always we need to, also we need to, to bring back to the table. Yeah. And I think, I think oh, what's, I, I'm sorry if you don't mind no, me jumping okay. in. I think what's interesting here is you sort of say uh, what is, well, you know, kind of the question of what is ugly, but I guess it also is a question of what is functional in type yeah. design, right? Because I suppose you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of Comic Sans as a functional typeface. <laughs> you would think of it as a stylized typeface. So I guess um, it, it comes down to sort of looking, I guess, at, again at these, um, what we consider to be a functional type family. Yeah. Yeah. 
straight lines is maybe not necessarily always the case, right? Yeah. Não é sobre é, a funcionalidade da Comic Sans, é sobre uma, usar a Comic Sans, que é uma fonte questionada por nós, designers, para provocar, nos provocar como designers a pensar fontes que sejam mais funcionais para diferentes pessoas, para que a gente faça um design mais inclusivo. Então, eu acho que inclusive teve uma percepção no grupo, na hora de julgar o projeto, que não é sobre a Comic Sans ser a fonte adequada à dislexia. É, a fonte, é usar a Comic Sans como uma provocação para a gente pensar tipografias que sejam mais funcionais, mais inclusivas, mais diversas. Eu acho que é essa que é, é o X, é o ponto desse projeto. Né? Não é sobre a funcionalidade da, da Comic Sans, mas é usá-la para provocar a gente a pensar no design mais inclusivo. So for Ricardo, is that happens when they were judging the projects that no one question how good or bad Comic Sans is. Is more having Comic Sans and a starting point to designers to think about the best, how can we raise the bar, go to the next level of design fonts that, that can help people with dyslexia, in more or less this case. Fantastic. And Nupa, let's move on to yours, because I want to make sure we have plenty of time for discussion as well. <laughs> yeah, it's unique. Try that again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about what we've just seen. Uh, this, it's a custom headline typeface for Vogue Brazil. Um, and uh, what I thought was, yes. Yes. <laughs> OK. Uh, in, uh, in, in the type world right now, everybody seems to be making these mega super families with like lots of weights and lots of styles. and. Uh, maybe supporting multiple scripts and a whole range of really large size projects. Uh, what stood, up, stood out to me about this particular project that it is a really small project. It's, it's a single weight family in two styles, a serif and a sans, with stylistic alternates in both the styles. So essentially just two styles and you have a, a large variety of things that is fit for an editorial use. So I think a very small family packs a punch, and I think that is what was really nice about this project. Like, I feel you don't really need to do a lot of things or large scale projects. Like, actually, like Chloe was saying, that people are using 700 fonts in one project and then, uh, or in the same identity or to show diversity, maybe. So, I mean, that was a trend a couple of years ago where people were combining a lot of different styles into one uh, branding project or one type family to show diversity. But I think this is more like multiplicity and not diversity. So the same, the same family speaks in multiple voices, but it still comes together like a cohesive family and for editorial use, which I thought was really, really interesting. Um, also, I feel that the brief was for them to combine two contrasting ideas. So they wanted to uh, have the vernacular lettering from Brazil represented with the elegance of what Vogue stands for. So there were two really contrasting ideas that blend in together in this family. So that is what I thought was really interesting about this one. I think it's not, I mean, obviously this is a, this is a design for the page, this, uh, this type design. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, sort of coming back to what these two have been talking about before and like now that sort of graphic design has to work so much harder and do so many more different jobs. Yeah. Are we going to see, you know, are we going to see less and less of this? Like, you know, is there going to be a still a place in the future for, for smaller font families? Definitely looks like, and that is what was really <laughs> interesting here, right? Because it sort of seems that everybody needs to go super big 
but it doesn't seem to be the case here. It, it proves you wrong right there with it, with just two styles, which I thought was fantastic. Mm. And Neville and Claire, I'm going to sort of, depending on which of you would like to kind of comment, maybe you, maybe you sort of have some thoughts on this, especially sort of given the projects that you presented. Like, do you sort of agree? Do you think that there's still a place for kind of small, you know, smaller families of, of, of font, uh, of typeface um, in, the, in the world where we have to be in so many different spheres, both digital and um, in print? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's like hotels in a way, isn't it? Um, you need the small boutique hotel, and then you need the Holiday Inn, which is the Comic Sans Hotel. <laughs> um, and then you have, you have the global hotels, which want to use everything. And then those global hotels are now trying to look like boutique hotels. <laughs> so they're borrowing from this kind of small personal language yeah. um, and unpredictability. Yeah. Um, but it's refreshing to see something which is, which is small and yeah. personal and contained. Yeah. And I th again, I think there's a confidence in that rather than trying to throw too much at it. And actually, um, I loved what you were saying about the, the simplicity of it. And actually, that's what stood out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we like you say we had we saw lots of lots of typefaces, and I think there was a real mix. I think that's brilliant. Like you were saying, there's you know there has to be a hotel for everyone, there has to be typeface, um, large and small for everyone. But I think um, it would be such a shame if we, everything was just big and and, and kind of loud. And mm -hmm. I think um, a lot of the stuff that we were gravitating to as a jury, it was maybe almost kind of on a, on a bit of a spectrum. Like we loved the strip back minimal stuff. We were loving the textures. We were loving things that just like uh, classic graphic design that we'd really got drawn to, as well as the new stuff. And things that took, things that took time. Yeah. Things that took time to really explore um, that weren't instant. And we've been talking a lot about how graphic design has to become seamless, delivering a user from entry to click or buy or exit, and. What we were celebrating was the idea that graphic design is, is friction. I was talking with Priya last night about this, about how we need more friction in our, in our culture. And for you to be sort of in the graphic design category, sort of, I think, relating also to the project that Ricardo showed and the, the Comic Sans, I guess this idea of, you know, we are seeing more inclusivity, diversity, are sort of been kind of big buzzwords in the sphere for a while, but I guess maybe this is the, us seeing it, seeing the impact of that in a much bigger, more kind of cohesive way as sort of less of an afterthought and really sort of key to, to thinking. Is, are you seeing that also in the graphic design sphere and then the projects that you judge? Yeah, I think the, there was a real spectrum. I think there was ones that were doing design for good, which was brilliant. I think we, I was chatting to some people last night um, after all the judging and there was a few people saying that there was almost a couple of projects that um, we're maybe trying to pull on the heartstrings a little bit. And actually, we had something and a few things in our category that we would go, love the concept, love the idea, love that graphics are being used to support um, real change. But the graphics are a bit crap. And actually, um, we, we had to be really hard on ourselves and try not just kind of get that kind of wash of, oh, that's, that's brilliant and it's helping, you know, it's helping people. But actually, you know, Neville kept bringing us back to but is it brilliant graphic design? And, and I think that was a real kind of watch out for us, especially in, with so many entries, um, just to make sure that at the core, it has to be a great idea, but it also has to be beautifully executed and, and kind of work um, uh, fit for purpose as well. I don't know if you would agree with that. <laughs> the milk one. Ricardo, I'm gonna come back to you. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd love to know a little bit more. I mean, um, hopefully you've been able to follow a little bit what the other panelists have been speaking about, but sort of, in the sort of in the wider typography category that you were judging, did you sort of also kind of notice any particular trends emerging or sort of particular themes that may sort of you know sphere from any of the kind of topics we've talking about? Maybe it's sort of about the rise of digital, um, or to do with kind of you know also this kind of conversation about inclusiveness and diversity. <coughs> Você viu algum trend que você achou interessante? Se foi inclusividade ou diversidade ou mix de fontes? Teve alguma coisa que te chamou a atenção? Algum trend, alguma tendência que você viu ali? É, do ponto de vista estético, não. Eu acho que a gente está 
num lugar de bastante diversidade de estilo. É difícil hoje você ver um grande movimento, você vê muita coisa acontecendo. Mas o que eu percebi e me deixou feliz é ver a representatividade da comunidade criativa e de tipografia ali no painel. Projetos do mundo todo. Vi muito projeto com, com ideograma chinês, muitos projetos do Oriente Médio. Então, tem uma, uma diversidade na, 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 no painel, na representatividade do que é o design, para além do, do euro, design europeu ou norte-americano, que me deixou é, feliz. E, e nessa, ainda nessa perspectiva, eu acho que tem uma, a gente, como cada um com seu repertório, a gente tem uma interpretação muito particular do projeto. Então, é muito importante a gente entender culturalmente qual é o briefing, qual é o contexto, então, é, quanto mais diverso for o painel, mais nos faz evoluir para a gente ter uma dimensão mais profunda sobre o que está acontecendo naquela perspectiva é, cultural. Então, e, inclusive, o nosso grupo era bastante diverso, os jurados eram de regiões do mundo bastante diferentes. Né? So, Ricardo, <coughs> sorry. For Ricardo, the, the, for Ricardo, the, uh, there wasn't anything new, not, not breaking nothing wow regarding trends. We have a lot of, for the entrance that he had, he received, and all the panel, the juries received, it was quite diverse in typefaces and typesetting. Uh, so for him, nothing, nothing new. However, he was really amused to see not, not the, the diversity that, of around the world type, typography and also the projects with, from Middle East, uh, let's say, not Euro, Euro or North America centric. So we have Chinese projects uh, from India and Middle East. And that representation, not only in the submissions, but also as part of the panel, for he was a, quite rich to see that and also to the exchange of knowledge on, uh, and how you can start paying attention, understanding a bit more of the, the, the non-Latin uh, alphabet. Yeah. Nipo, do you, did you sort of find that as well? I mean, obviously someone who, um, you know, you're, you're a specialist in, uh, in non-Western typefaces. Do, do you, did you sort of see that a little bit in your category? Are we sort of starting to see a little bit less sort of Western-centric in terms of the kind of type design that's coming out? Uh, yes, uh, it was really interesting because we had uh, Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, uh, Indic, uh, Cyrillic, and Latin. So that, that was uh, really interesting to see. Also, because we had the, the jury panel had experts from all of these different writing systems. So there was, a, like he said, there was a lot of learning about those writing systems as well, and the context of the design of those individual typefaces. So, uh, so, so maybe sometimes a cultural reference or a historical reference or what has been designed in those scripts before, like is, is what has been designed, is that an experiment in that particular script? So, uh, so if, say, if there was a Tamil design, say, from India, what does it add to the repertoire of Tamil typefaces uh, for the users of that particular script? So those were like smaller nuances, which was really nice to know more about uh, or to know more of the context of the design from different places around the world, I would say. Really interesting. Yeah. And as sort of I was uh, involved in, in a jury insight session last year um, for DNAD, not in these categories, and I think one of the things that I was very aware of then that perhaps has emerged less now is sort of, I think we're seeing a lot of projects that were a direct response to kind of coming out of the pandemic and the sort of things that we craved or longed for. And Neville, I'm interested to hear from you whether you sort of feel like any of those kinds of themes continuing or do you feel like we're sort of now finding, finding our new normal essentially? Um, I think we're finding our new abnormal. <laughs> um, I don't think there is a new normal. Uh, what we saw, I mean, coming back to your point, Nicole, um, and Ricardo, um, we had more high-quality international entries this year than I've ever seen, um, which is pretty amazing. And actually, when we got it down to our last um, uh, top entries, um, they were pretty much all international entries. And that, that, not leveling out, but leveling up, was an amazing thing to see. So um, the pandemic, I think, has forced people down into the detail a lot more. And we're definitely, pandemic, I don't think anyone mentioned the word pandemic in our, 
in, in the whole two days of judging. It's like, it's, was that last century? I can't quite remember. But um, we seem to be definitely now figuring out, okay, we've been through this stuff. What happens now? Technology has shifted. Um, AI is our post-pandemic pandemic. Um, and it's not a question of if we're going to use it, it's how we're going to use it. You know, what impact does that have on type design? You know, um, can you do a sans and then press a button to produce a serif? Yes, of course. So I think that's going to be the really interesting thing that's going to impact really heavily over the next year or two. Really interesting. And we're sort of running out of time now, but I'm just going to ask a closing question to Chloe. Uh, as a sort of uh, as someone who's so involved in kind of nurturing young talent, what tips would you give to the audience, anyone that's kind of, I guess, you know, just starting out in, in the world of graphic design, typography, type design, what do you think are the sort of going to be the key focuses looking ahead? From a point of view of today or to the, at uni or? Uh, I think, I think, I guess, in terms of um, the, the climate and what, the, what are the things that are going to become important to consider in this field going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think continually learning I, I think I mean not just for, for the students or, or everybody here I mean I'm learning every day and I think never stop you know, all these new technologies that are coming I think um, it's really easy to, to kind of just stick to what you're what you know and actually I think continually learning continually kind of pushing yourself um, trying things out um, you know the AI is a big uh, you know a big kind of cloud that's kind of coming over us let's kind of embrace it and, and rather than just kind of stick into what we know I think uh, the trends do kind of come and go. I think we, we were really um, kind of drawn to printed books and the tactility and scoring and, and you know, touch and, and, and actually not uh, forgetting about that um, and not just thinking that everything has to be digital in motion and actually remembering things like whether it's packing design or stamps or books, they live in the real world, not just on the screen. So I think remembering printing things out, um, thinking about the paper stocks and, and not just focusing too much on screen uh, and getting out into the world, uh, well back into the world maybe after pandemics um, and actually it's kind of a real, we, w I don't know whether we were just drawn to that after a few years of doing judging from just on screen but it really kind of made a difference when you kind of saw the physicals and, and I, I think that is something that everybody should remember that this is still in the real world and not everything is uh, super digital and metaverse yeah fantastic a good closing message i think <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much to all my speakers and thank you so much everyone for joining this session i hope you enjoyed it